Well, 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 here we are again. It's another Saturday. It's noon Eastern time. It must be time for a live stream and ask me anything live stream except a special. Ask me anything live stream. Good morning, Andrea. Good morning, Brian. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. It's the uh, it's the Johnny Lob edition, we like to call it. Bringing in John Lob here today to talk a little bit about football, but uh, the rookies, but you know, they're not a lot of not a lot of free agent news this week, right? It's been a pretty quiet week, so we'll kind of catch up on any major moves of interest. Nothing has happened since the last live stream on Wednesday of major interest. I know Elijah Moore, all those things we talked about a little bit. So uh, we wanted to get into the rookies, and uh, no better way to do that than with my esteemed colleague, uh, master of the college fantasy football world, and a uh, as knowledgeable a rookie maven as you will find out there, the one and only John Lobb. Joining me from Football Diehards, for, and you know his work from here. You follow him on Twitter at GridironSkull91. Uh, let's bring him on in. John, good morning. Good morning, Bob. I mean, not only do I get to talk um, rookies with you, but it's UConn's in the Elite Eight today. So I'm really excited for tonight. But right now, it's all about the rookies. Right. I mean, John Bonneville even noted, you know, DJ Chark to the Panthers is interesting. But again, we'll catch up on the, some of those moves. Zane Gonzalez traded to the 49ers after he got released. They, they're chicanery. I call it <laughs> I call shenanigans on uh, the Panthers. But anyway, Panthers making a lot of moves, adding DJ Chark to their Adam Thielen edition. But but there were uh, – and, and John is – Comping at the bit for the rookies chat as well. So we'll get right into it here without delay because we got a lot of ground to cover. And we'll start out with, you know, I know we've talked on the live stream. And if you missed the previous live streams, by the way, I'm Bob Harris. He's John Lobb. Uh, we're from footballdiehards.com. Go to the website. John's articles are up. His rookie assessments, top of the class at quarterback, running back, wide receiver are available. Tight end has been added since we last talked in the second tranche of running backs which we'll discuss today. But before we get into those, and again, follow me on Twitter at Football Diehard. Follow him at Red Honor Skull 91 to get all, make sure you're on top of all the content. You can listen to me tonight also on SiriusXM Fantasy Sports Radio. Um, Mike Dempsey and I will be on with Jamie Calandro will be joining us from the Football Diehards website as well. So lots going on. But the rookie, John, the rookies were all doing their pro day things uh, this week. There have been a number of mock drafts out, so we'll kind of tie those uh, ends together and, and note that, the top quarterbacks all apparently look pretty damn good, right? And so in the latest mock drafts, I see, you know, of the top, the teams in the top four that need quarterbacks, three of them, all grabbing their quarterbacks in whichever order, whether it's C.J. Stroud, uh, Bryce Young, uh, Anthony Richardson seems to be the guy that's going to the Colts. I know Chad Ryder put him in today for a... Uh, uh, a trade up. The Colts actually trading up so nobody could jump ahead of them. But however you see it, did, did those make sense? And, and like, just first of all, your impressions from the pro days, uh, anything that caught your eye or that you heard? Well, in general, I do watch, but I don't hold too much value. I much more um, appreciate the film study that I've done well in advance and my model itself. I mean, I always kind of joking back. Remember the Johnny Manziel Pro Day when they put the broomsticks up and everyone was always overly impressed with Johnny Manziel? Yes, I do like the arm strength and it is nice to look at the mechanics, but nothing's really going to change in my book. I guess I'm most surprised by the people who react to the Pro Days because if you've studied these players as in-depth as I have, I really didn't see anything that I hadn't seen on film from C.J. Stroud. I just think he's the best thrower of the football, barring no one's even close in this class. And when I say thrower of the football, I'm combining accuracy, touch, and the ability to throw the ball deep. C.J. Stroud does all of those things so incredibly well, Bob. And if you've been watching him on film, it was all obvious. And one thing that caught my mind early this week, I tweeted out, I think it's actually underrated how amazing of a prospect this young man is. When I go back to my model in the last five years and I look with him in comparison to some of the other quarterbacks, his numbers are off the charts, Bob. His passing efficiency, only to a tag of Viola, has a higher passing efficiency in the last five years. He has the highest completion percentage. He beat Joe Burrow 
And Joe Burrow had Justin Jefferson and Jamar Chase, so you can't tell me that his, you know, CJ Stroud had better prospects. You got Chase and Jamar and Justin Jefferson. Burrow's in the same boat. Touchdown to interception ratio. Bob, he's got the best touchdown to interception ratio of the last five years. And I was blown away with Trevor Lawrence at 90 to 17. And CJ Stroud is 85 to 12. And his yards per attempt. Only Tiger Viola and Kyler Murray in that Lincoln Riley system throw the ball deeper down the field. I mean, I'm just in love with him. To me, it's not even close that he's the number one. And of course, the size, you know, it matters in my model, but he's big and he's got the arm, Bob. Right. I think, you know, we spent like a couple of the comments in there, you know, and I think you answered actually the first one. Brian Larkin did the combine change your opinion about any of the rankings, you know, maybe maybe slightly, you know, maybe slight changes. But I mean, I think for the most part, John's process is mostly about, you know, studying the college play and the film. And, uh, and uh, you know, there would have to be something crazy uh, to really turn him around. So speaking of something crazy, Anthony Richardson's combine was crazy, right? And so I mean, <laughs> suddenly he's talked about in this top tier. This seems like the Colts are on board with this, right? I mean, that's that's what the the mocks want us to believe. Um, did we see him going this high? How, 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 I mean, did the combine change the dynamic notably here? My partner on the rookie big board, who I do the video series with, he always mentions don't double count athleticism. I believe if you would watch Anthony Richardson over the last year at Florida, Bob, his athleticism was never in doubt. Last right. year in my Debbie rankings over the summer, Anthony Richardson was in the top six. I might have had him at five or six. I forget exactly where he was. But we had not seen a lot out of Anthony Richardson. He just didn't have a lot of games played. Even entering the NFL, he's only played 19 games for the Florida Gators, which is a little bit of a red flag for me for experience. But let's read between the lines, right, Bob? That's what we do in Fantasy and Dynasty. I think the Colts kind of showed us their hand by signing Gardner Minshew. Isn't he the perfect veteran bridge quarterback? He played with the coach last year in Philadelphia. He knows the system, right? Minshew appears to be a good teammate from all reports that I've seen. He might be end up in that um, Ryan Fitzpatrick bucket, you know, where you look at his career and you're like, wow. Minshew had a really good career when given the opportunity. And then what do you do in 2024 or 2025? You give the reins to Anthony Richardson. I'm a believer in a red shirt for certain quarterbacks. You know, going into the NFL, we've seen it wildly successful with Patrick Mahomes. And I'll go back to Carson Palmer, the Heisman Trophy winner at USC. I really think Richardson needs that season to learn and sit on the bench. And when you have Minshew and Jonathan Taylor, I do think you can win some games. I understand now why the Colts would draft them there, Bob, based on ceiling, as long as you don't have to play them. I really hope the young man gets a year or at least 12 games to learn the NFL game before they put him on the field. I agree with that, like about 98% of what you just said. The, the exception would be, you know, in the case where the youngster comes in and really impresses. And it, it, oh. we've seen this, we've seen this movie before, right, John, with, with Russell Wilson kind of started that trend in <laughs> Seattle where they had spent big money on Matt Flynn. Not that the, the Col you know, the Colts spent big money on Minshew. And I agree a hundred percent with that logical move. And if it works out that way, great. But if Richardson is maybe a little better than expected or shows signs, I'm, I'm all about getting these rookies in right away and figuring out uh, something John Bonneville mentioned. The Zach Wilson pro day will haunt us for years to come. Also, yeah. <laughs> his play to date will haunt the Jets for years to come uh, unless he eventually gets back on track. And so that's the problem. If you do throw these guys in too early, uh, it's going to be a mess. Uh, we have some people in here in the comments thinking Richardson to Houston. I don't think that's going to be the case. I think they'll play it safe with and, and I think the mocks tend to agree with that. Uh, you know, they're going to take their choice of whether it's young or Stroud. Did, we, did you read much into, John, the comment by uh, Josh McCown at the Pro Day? Oh, we'll get down on the courts in Charlotte. Is that maybe more reference to like a, a coming visit 
to the team more than a, hey, we're going to draft you? Because the, the comments were pretty laudatory after the Bryce Young workout as well, right? You know, I, I, I thought a lot about Josh McGowan and the comments. I wonder if he's just a little bit new with the whole draft and, like, keeping it on the down low. I think Mc, he's not that much older, right? What's he, probably early 40s, right? This is new to him. So maybe he let a little bit cats out of the bag. But I understand why he would want to get to know C.J. Stroud because I think that's an important relationship, Right. So he's probably trying to form a relationship, and he probably should have kept it on the DL. That's kind of how I looked at it. But I think McNown saw what I've seen on film. Yeah, I think, you know, so I'm not, yeah, I'll, I'll just say that I wonder if we aren't, you know, we're, we're so eager to read into these things that, that maybe there is an impending visit. I know B. John Robinson visited Philadelphia. Players get a, a certain number of visits, right? So, it may have been that simple, but we're not going to make anything simple at this point. Uh, McCown's <laughs> job confirmed roommates, according to John Bonneville. Uh, Boofy says Panthers going Stroud. Bryce will go to the Colts, and he thinks Richardson to Houston. Also, he had a question in there that I'll just answer real quick. I think Chris God, he wanted to know if Chris Godwin in the fourth round of, of current drafts, and he doesn't specify dynasty, so he's saying redraft. So I've been saying, John, all along, and just, you know, you can kind of chip in on, chime in on this as well. That we're oh we we tend to overstate the the impact of quarterbacks on uh on the wide receivers we did it last year with guys like DK Metcalf Tyler Lockett uh, I'll say we did it with Amari Cooper Chris Godwin you could probably wait a little longer and get him in the fifth round but if you're really eager to get him go ahead and go forth there's a little talk of them taking Will Levis maybe at 19 also an outlier of sorts in the in Daniel Jeremiah's most re recent mock you want to touch on that. I, you know, Daniel Jeremiah came out and he had projected Hendon Hooker as a first round pick to, I believe he said the Minnesota Vikings. I look at so many um, mock drafts sometimes. I don't think he said the Vikings. And we've heard discussions about how long will Kirk Cousins be in Minnesota. So I think there is a possibility. Now they also have a whole wide receiver. So it's going to be interesting to see where the Vikings go in that regard. But I was shocked, and I anyone who's listened to me throughout this process, I'm pretty high on Hendon Hooker. He's my number four quarterback, Bob. In my model, Hooker is the only prospect who hits all six of my benchmarks. From a statistical standpoint, he's simply amazing. I get that it's a gimmicky offense in Tennessee, and I happen to love Josh Heupel's offense in Tennessee. They take advantage of space and they get these wide receivers in open one-on-one -on -one matchups. It's great to watch as a football fan. And of course, um, Hendon Hooker took advantage of it. So sometimes I think we underrate. Not every quarterback could go to Tennessee and be that successful in that scheme, Bob. We always sometimes overrate that every player who goes to Tennessee is gonna be good. That's not necessarily true. So there is talent there. And if you dig deeper, you I think watching the film, yeah, he has some flaws. I get it. You know, I mean, I don't see a lot of anticipatory throws on film. So that's something that you would probably need to explore a little bit more. I get he didn't take a lot of snaps. I think I saw he had like 17 or 21 percent of his snaps came from under center. So there might be a learning curve with Hendon Hooker. But we discussed it with Anthony Richardson. The Vikings could play Kirk Cousins for a year at the position. The upside of Hendon Hooker with his arm strength, his ability to get first down with his legs, and he has a great touch on the deep ball. Bob, I really like how he throws the deep ball. Mm -hmm. I think he's underrated um, as far as accuracy in the middle of the field. And I go by statistics. He completes two-thirds of his passes. Bob, I don't care where you're throwing, but that's a pretty good number. And he did play at Virginia Tech. Those totals include Virginia Tech. So I'm all in on Hooker. I have him as my number four. And I would be happy in Minnesota with the landing spot there. All right. And so, and you did have, and I, I guess Jer Jeremiah has him at, what, what is that? Minnesota at 23. 19 20. was Will Levis. But just, you know, quickly before we move on to these other positions. And hi, Wendy Early. Thanks for coming. Um, uh, Will Levis. 
does he beat out Baker Mayfield if he goes to Tampa Bay? And I'm leaving Kyle Trask out of the equation because I'm mean like that. <laughs> um, I, I don't think he does right away because I do think, Bob, that Will Levis has some problems in the pocket. I have not seen him master the pocket. And even though he's obviously gifted with his arm, there's no question about the arm strength. He can be flustered when he's hit. And all young quarterbacks can get flustered when they're hit. But I, he isn't Bryce Young, right? You, I mean, Bryce Young's so calm in the pocket. Will Levis is almost the polar opposite, maybe 178 degrees difference. He can be flustered. I think he needs some time also to learn the game. Right. So Scott, by the way, Scott Fitterer, mighty impressed with Bryce Young from dinner, right? I mean, he had, he had a lot of nice things to say about how <laughs> Bryce Young handled himself in a group of people. And uh, just uh, so, you know, we're, we'll find out enough uh, when the draft comes, but certainly we will be reading all those tea leaves. Uh, there was one other workout uh, 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 that that is maybe worth mentioning because Boofy brings it up in the chat. Jackson Smith and Jigba, he thinks would be great as a Viking. Maybe he would, maybe he wouldn't. I don't know about that. But that part, uh, his 40 time was suitable, right? I mean, I think everyone was pretty pleased with where he ended up on his 40, which he did not run at the combine. Yeah. I, I plugged in the numbers. I think we had a, a if my met four, four, five, two, four, five, three was the number at the pro day. I'm okay with his size and athleticism. I was more impressed if you look at his acceleration and burst in the um, three cone drill and the 20 yard shuttle, Bob. They are off the charts, extremely high percentile. That's what we saw on film at Ohio State. He gets such immediate separation. Now, when you watch his tape at, at Ohio State, Bob, he gets open deep. Now, some of it is Ryan Day just schemes a masterful passing game. I've watched so much Buckeyes over the last six years. So part of it is the scheme. However, if we get a good coordinator who understands how to use Jackson and Jigba Smith's skill set, he can beat you deep, but he'll do it with suddenness and subtle moves, not necessarily long speed. But, man, he is just a terror in the middle of the field and in the intermediate area, Bob. All right. Uh, so, and we'll get into these running backs here, but Brian Larkin had a question just kind of about uh, one, of the, one of the metrics you threw out there, uh, the scrimmage yards dominator, which is a percentile number that you give these players. Uh, you want to kind of explain what goes into that, John? Sure. So scrimmage yards dominator means if the offense put up 5,000 yards of, um, of total offense and we are looking at running back scrimmage yards dominator, if they had um, 1,500 yards between rushing and receiving, that would give them what 15%, uh, no, 30% of the total team yards. So what we're looking for from a running back is total scrimmage yards, we would prefer 30%. And there's some fudge, I mean, 28, I'm not going to hassle too much. But if you get down into the less than 20%, then the NFL wonders if the player can be a bell cow. From what I've read and what I've learned listening to scouts who do this, you know, I'm just, I just love football and I, you know, taught myself and watched and listened and learned. They like bell cows who have done it at the college level. So you're looking at a large scrimmage dominator means that this player can handle a heavy workload that includes hits. You know, you're getting football's a physical game at the running back position, right? So that the player can take big hits. For the receivers, it is a percentage of the team's passing yards. So if you have 3,000 yards passing as a team and then you have 1,000 yards receiving, that would be 33% of the team scrimmage yards. And we're looking again at about a number of 30%, I think is my benchmark. We want to see a receiver who's been productive as the alpha male of his offense. All right, that makes perfect sense. Hope that helped you out there, Brian. By the way, if anyone else has any other questions, hello again, thanks for coming. This is the Football Diehards live stream. Ask me anything, John Laub, special edition. Follow him on Twitter at GridironSkull91 for all the goodness that is John Laub. Also go to the Football Diehards website if you haven't ordered up there, use the promo code DIEHARDS to get 15% off. Hit our YouTube channel. If you haven't subscribed here, subscribe. Hit the like button if you like this conversation. I will dislike it now just because I like to have a dislike. Um, 
Uh, and we'll go on and also uh, tune in tonight to Sirius XM Fantasy Sports Radio for the football diehards. Mike Dempsey and myself doing many, 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 many best ball drafts. <laughs> Way more than we should before the draft, but that's what we're doing. <laughs> um, so, and we'll get we'll get to the tight ends a little bit here, and you know, John Bonneville throwing in the comments. But go ahead and throw in your comments as you get to them, and I'll work them into the conversation, John, and anyone else out there. Happy to work in uh, to kind of hit your direct thoughts here. But we'll start out. We're going to start out with the running backs, and then we'll get to the tight ends, John. So I will um, bookmark this and keep you in mind. Um, so we'll start out with the uh, the second tier of running backs. And in case you missed John's first tier, I will politely let you know the number. The first tier is obvious. B. John Robinson, John like Zach Charbonnet uh, is number two. Jameer Gibbs at number three. I think uh, that's you know that's a little aggressive on Charbonnet, John. I like that. Jameer Gibbs, Israel Abanikanda. I can say that right when I try really hard. Con Con Kendra Miller and Ty J Spears. So we will jump into the next tier. And I don't think any of the names here are going to be especially surprising either, John. We'll start out with Roshan Johnson, who maybe if he didn't play with B. John Robinson would be uh, a little more widely talked about. Absolutely, Bob. And first thing I'll say, he played behind B. John Robinson. And we have seen historically... The NFL is willing to draft two running backs. I mean, I go all the way back to the Pony Express with Eric Dickerson and Craig James. And more recently, we just saw North Carolina with Javonta Williams and Michael Carter. So you yeah. should not be concerned that Roshan Johnson was basically for the last three years second string on the Longhorns because he's playing behind such an incredible prospect in B. John Robinson. And... One of the things that I noticed, like when you play college fantasy football, I watch a lot of Longhorns because I had Bijan on some teams and I'm scouting them for my profiles. Roshan Johnson popped at times, Bob, and he cost me more fantasy points than I would like to admit in college fantasy football because he would score touchdowns or he would make a big play. And you're like, why isn't Bijan in there? And I said, I, I, we previewed the Senior Bowl way back in January on Matt and I. And I said on the show, Roshan Johnson is – the NFL is going to like him a lot more than fantasy fans expect. When you plug him into your model, Bob, he's not going to pop from a production standpoint. It's just – the numbers just aren't there because of limited touches. But there's one thing I noticed right away. He's 6 feet 219. I mean, that's just – that's NFL size. He's got a quarterback background, Bob. In high school, he was one of the best dual threat quarterback prospects there was. He arrives at Texas and he leads the team in rushing as a freshman. I mean, he was really good as an 18 slash 19 year old player, which which um, foretells future success from an NFL draft prospect. But then this guy Bijan Robinson walks on campus. Roshan, I'm impressed with this. He could have left, Bob. He could have gone to any school in the Big 12. He could have gone north to the Big 10. I could probably name 50 schools that would have gladly taken Roshan Johnson as their starting back, but he stayed there. And when you look deeper into the research, his teammates and the coaching staff love him. Very, very good young man. But you know what? He runs with power. He runs with passion. He played in the Wildcat when you saw him at Texas. He can throw the ball. So you can do a lot of very interesting things. I'm at number seven. I would not be surprised if he gets picked in the second round because like Ramadre Stevenson, like lots of big backs, um, Tyler Algier, I think he's a better prospect than Tyler Algier was coming out. I think he was on Bruce Feldman's freak list last year, if I remember. So we know the athleticism there is with size. I like him a ton, Bob. Yeah, I think uh, I think I kind of agree with all that assessment. And I and I and like I think as I look, you know, over this list of uh, you know in, in advance of today's show and when you published it, again, it's available on FootballDieHards.com. Uh, I noticed a lot of these names that we're going to see, including Roshan Johnson, going in the best balls that I've been going in. I think people are 
being a little bit more willing or open to drafting rookies later in drafts. We see that they're, especially at receiver, but also at the running back position. So some of these guys we're talking about here today, I've been seeing going. Good morning, Albert. Good morning, Mr. Scampers. Uh, good morning, Zara. Thanks for coming, everybody. Um, so let's move on to the next one, who is a guy definitely I've seen kind of go fairly often in best balls, it seems fairly late. Sean Tucker out of Syracuse. John, uh, what should I like about him? His production at Syracuse is incredible, Bob. My production model absolutely really likes this young man. Now, I'll admit, he has slipped further down the board than any other prospect over the last four or five weeks. One, he didn't test at the combine, which is, you know, he showed us something, but we need a straight 40 time. So I was optimistic about his pro day. But Bob, did you see he tweeted like his pro day numbers? And I'm, I mean, I don't know, maybe it's my old man curmudgeon in me. I'm just going to be a little skeptical. You know, I just wish we could have gotten some, maybe an outside judge to witness some of this. I know the athleticism is on the film, but Bob, we need proof, right? And that a little bit bothers me. Also, he is a better outside runner than inside runner. The more I studied him on film, he definitely would more likely thrive in an outside zone or an outside run scheme, I, which what that tells me is it limits his upside as a touchdown maker. I don't think you're going to put him at the goal line. And, you know, we love those, we love double digit touchdown scores, right? So, and I think there's a balance, right? How many receptions could he get compared to touchdowns, right? So there's always that Derrick Henry had all the touchdowns we ever wanted and limited receptions. Sean Tucker looks like a player who's probably going to be the 50 hmm. reception type of fantasy asset. But I kind of think he's in the Duke Johnson bucket right now. I like him. He'll have a role in the NFL. In DFS, if he gets a, a spot start, we could really like him at a low salary cap price that week. I do like him, but he he's number nine on my list right now. Well, yeah, no, number eight. I'm sorry, number eight on my list. I like him. Not in love with him, but I do want to see draft capital. Yeah, John Bonneville also has some, had some some suspicions about what you mentioned the 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 posting of numbers and things that he thinks maybe <laughs> feels like he's hiding something and maybe he is and maybe with good reason. But you know the thing about me for running backs, John, is I mean you know they're it's it's such a transitory position and the way the NFL views mm -hmm. it now that you know if circumstances work out the right way any of these guys could end up being primary backs. I think we see how injuries, attrition, or just the willingness to move on uh, can do that. Uh, Tank Bigsby, uh, and we'll focus on the big portion of that. He seems like a, seems like a pretty, pretty big boy, 210 pounds, uh, compact build. Uh, what do you like about him? One, he's an SEC back. And, you know, I grade, but I grade every player on their skills and their production model. But Tank Big, Bigsby, the NFL is going to like him. They like these big backs coming out of the SEC conference. He's a three-year starter at a Power 5 program. When he showed up at 210, we knew he had the size that I like when I put him into my model. He's 6'0". He's an underrated pass catcher. He has 62 career receptions. Bobby's not like Barkley or, or Najee Harris or one of the elite, but in dump offs, get him in space and get him on the edge. He's an adequate pass catcher. I think he bounces the ball or he kind of bounces behind the line of scrimmage, but part of that's the Auburn offensive line. Similar, remember when we were talking about Cam Akers and Florida State had that terrible offensive line, and sometimes you just saw Cam Akers get swallowed up for a one-yard loss because there was literally no blocking in front of him? Tank Biz Biggs kind of is in a similar situation, Bob, where that offensive line was not very good at Auburn. So you saw him try to do things, try to move the chains and to make things happen. He can run the ball between the tackles. If you look at he averaged 5.4 yards a carry. I do believe the NFL is going to like his size and power between the tackles. He clearly has a role at the NFL level. 
at times he left me leaving for more. I'm probably a little lower on Bigsby than most, but I do see what the NFL might really like. And you might get a team in the second round that just says, you know what, the value's too much here. Let me go get Bigsby for my backfield. All right. And by the way, everybody, there's a link uh, in this article. If you go to the running back twos or any of these articles, you can see the full grades for all, you know, the running backs that John has graded and kind of get an idea of the work and the numbers behind them. Dwayne McBride out of the University of Alabama, Birmingham. Uh, you have him at number 10, John. I, you know, so this is this is a big argument in my own mind. <laughs> it's funny how you debate prospects when you're trying to figure things out. And I put Bigsby over Dwayne McBride because of the difference of the competition. Bigsby's at your Power 5 SEC school. Dwayne McBride is at the Group of Five programs in Conference USA. And Bob, let's just be honest, Conference USA is, de is defensively challenged. They're not, they're not going to put a lot of linebackers in the NFL. So there's a lot of things I like with McBride, but you have to factor in the level of competition. I do think he's got good feet. I think he's got very good vision between the tackles. He does. I like his power. Now, University of Alabama, Birmingham, out, Bob, they do not throw the ball to running backs. He only has five career receptions. And I know you and I have said it, and I've heard it by other people. Doesn't mean he can't catch. We just have not seen it on film. So that's something that you always have to be careful with when you grade these running backs. He, he doesn't pop in the production model because we don't have a lot of receptions in the books or on film. But I think he can compete at the NFL level. He has the size, 5'11", 215. That's very important for a group of five running back because when they jump up in the level of competition – can they physically handle it? I think the speed is there on tape. We're waiting for his pro day. So that's going to be our last data point, Bob. How fast is he exactly in the 40? If he comes outside of 455, I might be a little concerned. But reports are pretty positive he should end up in the 45455 range. As long as he does that athletically, I really like him. Some, some NFL national experts have them in their top five. I think that's a little bullish. But, Bob, remember um, Jordan Howard, the back from Indiana? He went to UAB. UAB have put some players in the NFL. I think McBride is one of those. However, from a fantasy football standpoint, I would be worried about his upside because he doesn't have the receptions on film. I'm not, not much on like Jordan Howard, who scored touchdowns but did not catch many passes. By the way, John Bonneville, uh, John does not like McBride over Kendry Miller. Kendry Miller is number five overall on John's list oh. right now. So uh, we hit him on the last group. So Mark Spafford also wanted to make a comment about some speculation. The Browns are eyeing Jarek McKinnon. Somebody's eyeing him because the Chiefs are probably not going to spend up. And the Chiefs may be a team that looks to go cheaper. I was talking to a local observer there. Uh, Pete Sweeney from Arrowhead Pride, who thinks they may target J.D. McKissick, assuming his neck is okay, and try and turn a cheaper piece into the new Jarek McKinnon. But McKinnon's likely moving on, and so and so is Kareem Hunt. We'll see where they we'll see where they end up. Um, let's go on to your next running back, John. And again, throw in your questions if you have them. We'll work them into the conversation. We'll finish up these running backs here. Devin Chain and Zach Evans both at eleven and twelve. Um, I know, I know for a chain, it's, he's not a big guy, right? That worries you a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I, and I know I'm a little bit of an outlier here. I mean, I've seen people have him in their top three. And, Bob, I will not argue with him on tape. He's been great at Texas A&M. However, my mom said odds of a player under 200, let alone under 188, at 5'9", are greatly diminished. Will he have a role in the NFL? Absolutely. And one thing, I mean, we're a fantasy show, so my rankings also take into right. account fantasy. Devin A. Chain might be a better NFL football player than he is a fantasy player. He might excel on 10 to 12 touches 
and he might get you special teams punt and kick. So I see a role in an NFL offense, yet I think we both admit volume is usually king in fantasy sports. At 188, Bob, I just say to myself, could he ever do five games in a row with 20 touches? I don't see it in the outcomes. And I have loved watching Devon Aching. And he might even be a better receiver, you could argue. I mean, what is what is his catch? He has 65 receptions. And Texas A&M is not like a prolific passing game by any stretch of the imagination, people. And their quarterbacks have been bad. Sorry, Texas A&M fans. But their quarterback has not been good. So 65 receptions in that offense is really, really nice. But I just say to myself, he's not a 20-touch ceiling guy. I think he's the classic running back by committee. Maybe he gets 50% of the touches. You know, it's interesting. I would say this, but I think he looks like an Eagles back. Like, he would be perfect on the Eagles, but they have so many running backs. But that's the type of, if he was in a three-man committee, he might be incredible from a football standpoint. Okay, and Tim, by the way, John Bonneville would like him to go work out with Austin Eckler and put on that similar <laughs> amount of muscle that, that Eckler has over time. And by the way, Eckler, you know, has been granted and received uh, permission to seek a trade. Don't expect him to go anywhere, people. This is, uh, this is, seems like going through the motions. Anything can happen. We all know that in this league, but I don't, you know, and look, Christian McCaffrey got moved last year, maybe in season, maybe we see something, but uh, not before the draft, I don't think. I don't think. Uh, we will see. Um, and so let's uh, quickly touch on Zach Evans before we get into tight ends. I like Zach Evans, but he showed up a lot smaller. They had him listed at 216, Bob. He shows up at 202. And I like the footwork. I think they're very fleet. They're fancy. He can get between the tackles. But every time I watch him, he leaves me wanting more. I don't think he's hit his ceiling. However, I say to myself, is he really likely to hit his ceiling as an NFL player? Like, are they going to be able to tap into his potential that we saw in high school and at times in film? I can't argue with some of the film, but there's also sometimes when I watch him where I'm not overly impressed. And I know, look, at he lost his job essentially to two other players. And, and a lot of things happen, and coaches don't always make the right decision. I totally understand that. Maybe he gets with the right coach in a right system that just really likes his skill set and gives him the opportunity. But in the back of my mind, I said, he lost to a true freshman. I mean, that, I mean he was a junior and a top five prospect at the position, and he lost a job to uh, a junior. I'm probably not going to have a lot of shares of Zach Evans unless the price really comes down. But 202 is also a concern. He's not as big as I thought, Bob. Unlike coaches, John Lobb and I always make the right decisions. I have it on good authority. Ah, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we'll dive into the uh, the tight ends here. And uh, I think it's worth noting, you know, people talk about this being a really good class. And if you go and check out John's article and hit the uh, link to the, just the overall grades and uh, you know, what, what the model shows the benchmark for tight ends is 75, right? Is the grade we're looking for, for tight ends. We have a lot of tight ends over 75, John. Uh, <laughs> and, and I think that's a, that, do you, and we'll get into these guys a little bit individually, but do you think that's going to drive the price down that there's going to be some very good players that are going later than they normally would uh, in the NFL draft because there's so many highly rated tight ends that maybe people are going to be willing to wait a little bit. And maybe, you know, the high end guys seem like they're going to go. We'll talk about Michael Mayer, who, you know, seems to be losing a little steam here. Dalton Kincaid, Darnell Washington, et cetera. But, the, but that next tier, do you see them going maybe a little bit later because of that? And maybe we shouldn't get too caught up in their draft position as opposed to where the landing spot is and what their skill set is? I think we're going to end up with like two tight ends on day three, Bob, who impact our fantasy rosters, dynasty rosters down the road. I agree with you because if you don't get, let's say there's a big three. I think we'll talk about the big three at the tight end. 
So let's say you don't want to draft one of the big three. You want to go to the wide receiver, or maybe you want to dip into this offensive line because it's kind of shallow. It, the top is good at the offensive line, but it isn't what you want after that. So maybe you wait on your tight end. There's some really good athletes with really nice production on day three. So we have to keep an eye out as dynasty owners because I agree with you, Bob. I think there's a gem on day three. And am I, I think Isaiah likely of Coastal Carolina to the Ravens went on day three, if my memory serves me, last year. So there is going to be value later in the draft. And I like some of these players who I'll be keeping a very close eye on. All right, well, let's start out with the top of the list. I think going in, certainly going into the workout season and the combine season, Michael Mayer from Notre Dame was at the top of everybody's list and, and probably still is, but not as impressive as some of these other guys, uh, maybe with some of the numbers at, at the combine. Uh, you still have him ranked number one. Any reason to believe that he won't be the first tight end off the board? If a team falls in love with Dalton Kincaid, who's, I think, a better pass catcher, but I wonder if he's more of an inline blocker. So what you're, this is really a very interesting debate, right? What does your offense, what does your scheme, what does the coaching staff value from this position? I like Michael Meyer maybe more from an NFL standpoint, Bob. He can dominate in the run game. I mean, I like my tight ends who can smash defensive ends. I, I just... I think you, I, you, those are invaluable. I mean, all things we loved about Gronk, I think the thing that was the most underrated aspect of Gronk was his ability to dominate in the run game. He was just simply unbelievable. Michael Meyer has that. If you put him in motion and you let him slam someone, Bob, I mean, he can just collapse on the run game. I have Don Kincaid. One point, you talk about the grades, right? They're so close. I have Meyer at 90, Dalton Kincaid at 89. I also, Dalton Kincaid's um, profile, there's a wider range of outcomes. I think Michael Meyer is a really solid NFL starter. We never know about injuries, right? But I think being a two-way tight end, you're guaranteed to get a player who's going to get on the field very early in his career. When you have more of the pass-catching tight end, remember Jay Sternberger coming out of, um, was it, yeah, it was Texas A&M, right? Yeah. Going to Green Bay. And then you have Evan Ingram, who went to the Giants. When you get these really athletic, big-bodied, like, pass-catching tight ends, I think there's a very wide range of outcomes. With Michael Meyer, we might not have as high of a ceiling, but the floor, Bob, is so much higher because I do think he's an underrated pass catcher. I don't look at the numbers. 180 career catches for a tight end, Bob. In a in a their Notre Dame isn't like a, a Uber passing team. So that's an incredible number. His team aerial dominator, Bob, I would have been happy with a receiver with 30%. He had a team aerial dominator of 30% as a tight end. That is awesome. And he's very good in the red zone. So I have Michael Meyer above Dalton Kincaid, but I understand what people, they're looking at the pass catching ceiling of Dalton Kincaid. All right. Of course, Michael Meyer has that known weakness. He's very weak against Jamie Lee Curtis or Laurie Strode. How are you going to see that? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> uh, and so, where might it? So, Dalton Kincaid is widely believed, you know, viewed as right there with him. You have him ranked number two. Tell us a little more about him and who might be a good landing spot. Oh, I would love to see him on the Bengals. I mean, that would just be like gold because the mismatch would be so advantageous for him when you have T. Higgins, you know, if he remains a Bengal, and then Jamar Chase, and you have the quarterback in Joe Burrow. And I think the way their offense is set up, they'd be very happy to have a pass-catching tight end because so, Joe Burrow is so effective at getting the ball out of his hands, and he can miss. He's so good at slipping and sliding and and avoiding the pass rush. So I think Kincaid, that would be my ultimate landing spot, would be in Cincinnati for him. If you're looking for a two-way tight end, I really don't think Kincaid's what what you're looking to draft. I very much question his ability to run block. 
he might be a better route runner, but I also think there are going to be bigger safeties in the NFL, Bob, and there are going to be bigger coverage linebackers. Um, like take, for instance, Tremaine Edmonds, who the Bears just signed. I don't think Dalton Kincaid has come across one-on-one -on -one with a linebacker as athletically gifted as Tremaine Edmonds is in Buffalo last year and now in Chicago. They don't exist in the Pac-12. He's not going to see that type of player. The one thing about Meyer, he has seen the best of the best at the linebacker and the safety position with the schedule that Notre Dame plays. I think Kincaid will have a longer learning curve, especially in the run game. And can he physically take the pounding of the bigger defenders in the NFL? Uh, so just a couple comments here. Mr. Scamper, think the Chargers will be a nice spot for Kincaid. Uh, Joe, her, her, Joe Hay, Hay Bear, uh, was, it doesn't think of a place like Detroit because he can't play in line. Uh, I will throw out another one that uh, I kind of agree with Daniel Jeremiah's mock 3.0. Washington, I believe the new offensive coordinator there has made extensive use of tight ends and pass spots. Uh, that being <laughs> the city. But that, I want to get to the tight end that, like, one of these things is not like the others, right? And I tend to... <laughs> Knows a little more than uh, than most. Darnell Washington out of Georgia is not like all these others. Bob, you know it's funny because I know how much you and Mike and I always listen to your show on um, Sirius XM. I know the two of you love tight ends as much as I do. You guys might even like them more than I do. Darnell Washington is one of the funnest film evaluations I have ever done. Bob, he is. So so athletically gifted. I mean, it is kind of silly watching him dominate opponents. He, There is a little bit of a right tackle, which I'm worried, because maybe you get a coaching staff who says, you know, he's such a good blocker. We're just going to have him just dominate in the run game. And, and Bob, you can see sometimes on that Georgia run game, Darnell Washington is just so nasty. But when you get him out in space, you can get the ball in his hands. Bob, he's fast. He's athletic. He jumps over people. He puts his for six, seven. He can get low. I mean, and there's going to be some defensive backs who make a business decision. When Darnell Washington's coming at him with the ball in their hand, he's going to be a massive problem. I, I, I think he's a, a limited ceiling with a very high touchdown upside. I don't think he's ever going to be like that 60, 70 catch tight end, but he can be a 45 catch player with like eight touchdowns. Because Bobby's going to score like two or three 25 yard touchdowns because you're just going to get him out in space and he's just going to outrun everyone. And then in the goal line, he's a disaster to cover. I mean, he's 6'7, 264. Is he going to run block? Or is he going to go out to the corner of the pylon? I mean, he, wide range of outcomes with them. Production mm -hmm. model does not like him. Got to watch the film. And the, the athleticism that I saw. Now, I'll say, we, we were talking about combine. I'm not usually. But Darnell Washington was so impressive at the combine. He solidified his number three position in my rankings. All right, fair enough. So uh, the la the next two, and I and I think there's some other guys. Let's just do about a minute each on these, John, so we can get to some questions and a couple other players that people had asked about. Uh, Luke Musgrave out of Oregon State, Tucker Craft out of South Dakota State. Let's start with Musgrave. I'm a Musgrave fan. We have to find the medicals. I think he played in two games this year, if my memory serves me. Incredibly athletic, 6'6", 253. Go back to the 2021 film at Oregon State. The Beavers aren't a great passing game. He's uh, Bruce Feldman's freak list athletically, like him a ton. Tucker Craft, I went out of my way to watch him. If you don't know, South Dakota State is the FCS level. They won the championship. They actually beat North Dakota State, where Carson Wentz is from, and they're usually the best team in the FCS. Tucker Craft has everything you're looking for as an NFL tight end, 6'5", 254. There might be a learning curve, but Craft is much more athletic than you think. His numbers in my model pop off athletically, and I do like a lot of his tape. All right, and so let's finish it up here uh, with Tucker Craft. 
Oh, the, uh, um, I oh Sam, Le, who did you? Oh Tucker, I just said, I just discussed. Sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, there, we had a question here about a, kind of an outlier on your list. I mean, not in the top five, but but just outside there. And that was from John Bonneville wanted to know about uh, Zach Kunz. I'm sorry, I was trying to look up his question so I could get it on the radar here. No, you know, Zach Kuntz is the one guy I'm watching more than anything. He was great in 2021 at Old Dominion. He was a top three or four ranking in college fantasy football. Got injured, fell off the radar. Bob, he was a Penn State prospect. And we know Penn State has put uber quality tight ends athletically into the NFL. Kuntz went out at the Combine and his numbers are silly. They're almost Darnell Washington as far as an athlete at 6'7", 255. I don't think he's as smooth. But, man, Kuntz is fascinating. If he ever got on to day two, that means the medicals are good and the NFL really likes him. All right. And that's, uh, you know, I mean, I think, again, this is a pretty deep class. And uh, just to reiterate, you know, John's benchmarks for his grades are are 75. Right. That's, you know, that's what that's what you're looking for. I think we have, what, 10, 10 players on this list over 75 uh, and all the way up to Michael Mayer at 90, Kincaid at 89, Washington at 86. And I mean, it's it's a very deep class. So so, so uh, just, you know, a reminder, don't let the draft capital necessarily fool you on some of these players. Another player that uh, John Bonneville wanted to know about, uh, John, was Oklahoma running back Eric Gray. Any thoughts on him? Oh, Bob, I love him. He's my number 13. He just missed the cut. And I'm going to be doing a sleepers column for the football diehards coming up in about two weeks, probably. And Eric Gray is my number one sleeper. Dual threat running back. I think he's 5'10", 210 pounds. They're about very good pass receiver and very underrated between the tackles. I like Eric Gray a ton, but he's just, we're so deep, Bob. That's what happens. I think in a normal year, Eric Gray would have probably been the top 10, but I just have him outside at number 13. So it just, you know, if, just to generalize a little bit, running back class, fairly deep, tight end class, crazy deep. And we have a wide receiver class this year that seems like it, like there's a lot of good players, but we don't have any of the superstar kind of or anticipated superstars like we have in recent drafts. Bob, absolutely. I really think if once I go outside my top four from wide receiver number five to 20, I think you can mix them up anyway. I mean, I have how I graded them, but there's people with very different perspectives at this position. I think we're looking at, in my opinion, drafting them in dynasty drafts in rounds three and four and hoping if you like one, like let's just say I love Jaden Reed out of Michigan State. I think the value of Jaden Reed in your round four right now, I think he's around four average in ADP. I love him. If you love him, go get him because I think he can hit as much as almost anyone else in the, in that range of wide receiver. So, I, you know, just looking at current ADP, you know, you get into the, looking at some of the rookies. B. John Robinson in current best ball 10s ADP is running back or is going off a 16th overall. I think he's, oh. what is he? Just how, what, what's, what's your thoughts on that? He's like well inside, uh, you know, the top 15 here. He's, you know, I mean, clearly going off. He's moved up as high as six in the latest best ball. Um, Bob, I mean, you and I will be drafting, and I always want to tell our viewers the truth. If I can get him at number six in one of our magazine drafts, I'll take him that high. I think he could be special. I, I He's going, I mean, as long as he lands in a spot where we can get at least 60% of the touches, he's going to be special because he's a three-down back. I'm all in. It's like Ezekiel Elliott and Saquon Barkley when they came out. It just, uh, he's just such a complete prospect. So interesting. And by the way, the next receiver I'm seeing, uh, or the next running back I'm seeing off the board in the best ball tens is, uh, I think, Jameer Gibbs. Let me just double check that. Uh, running back 20 is Gibbs. And then after that, it, it's a little bit of a wait for some of these other running backs. But they're going. Zach Charbonnet, who John has at number two, is uh, running back 41. Uh, and I think that's where you start seeing a lot of them come off. The wide receivers, I want to say, 
Uh, Smith and Jigba is the is the is the first guy off the board, but it's not very early. Uh, let me just find that. Uh, yeah, he's like wide receiver forty one, and he is, I think, the first rookie off the board. So there you see kind of the difference in these two, you know, position groups from a fantasy perspective. It's as you'd expect, but we've seen in the past some of these wide receivers really come out with some huge buzz. We're not seeing that similar circumstance this time. A few other comments here, John, before we wrap it up, by the way. Follow John on Twitter, at GridironSkull91, for all kinds of rookie greatness and uh, college fantasy football greatness and general greatness. He's John Law. He's just generally great. A um, couple comments here, uh, John Bonneville. Where do you have A.T. Perry? Uh, and John loves him, by the way. <clears throat> um, but where do you see him at? I have him at number um, 26 right now, and I know he's getting a lot of buzz, and here's where being a fan of college football can sometimes hurt or benefit. Historically, wide receivers coming out of Wake Forest's program, Bob, have not transitioned to the NFL very well. He, What the coach does is they recruit these three and low four-star prospects, and they grow in their system. And by the time they graduate, they're usually four or five years on campus, and they begin to dominate their last two years. I have some questions about A.T. Perry. Athletically, he's very impressive, and he's got nice size at 6'3", 198. But I don't love the film, and none of these Demon Deacon players really become NFL stars. I want to say I just did a mock on mock where we did uh, uh, a group of us did a draft based on a mock draft. And I think I ended up with Perry. I think he'd gone to I want to say Denver or something. But anyway, uh, that's a, another story for another time. Uh, Joe Abair thinks the wide receivers, he doesn't have a lot of faith in them after wide receiver eight. Where's your confidence level? What is the what is the level that you're starting to feel like? Yeah, these are kind of borderline guys. Once I get off of Marvin Mims at number seven, I feel pretty good about all the other prospects behind him. Once I get past Mims, Bob, I could find a big hole in every receiver prospect after that. Something that screams, this is why they won't be successful at the NFL level. And paradoxically, I can also find something in which says each one of these players could be successful in the right system with the right quarterback. So I like him, but Mims is the cutoff point for me from a dynasty fantasy wide receiver. All right, everybody, if you have another question, get it in here before we call it a day. I'll just let you know once again, John Lobb, the Gridiron Scholar, uh, follow him on Twitter at Gridiron Scholar 91. Find his work right now. Football diehards, you'll find the quarterbacks, his top ranked quarterbacks, top ranked running backs, parts one and two, wide receiver, part one available, part two coming soon, John. It should be Monday. That's what I thought. I, I didn't want to. I didn't want to get too far in front of it. I thought you had said that. And the tight ends are available now. Also, there are links in those articles to the full grades of the top group, uh, the top tier players, and kind of find out what all the the various numbers are that are behind John and his model and everything, so you can figure it out. Uh, appreciate you all coming to this. Uh, I'll be back Wednesday. Email. We're on Wednesday schedule this week. I, I think the weekend we might be shaking it up a little bit, but we'll see. Uh, this weekend but as usual the normal time zones and things apply eastern time zone saturday is noon right here john will be back and we'll be doing more of these as the draft draws near wednesday 7 p.m eastern time uh next week it'll be thursday my bad i knew it was i knew there was a screwy day coming up so be back on thursday uh 7 p.m eastern time for your uh, listening and viewing pleasure. I think the viewing portion of that is probably a reach, but the listening is maybe okay. Um, and uh, again, more listening tonight, Football Diehards on Sirius XM Fantasy Sports Radio, uh, 7 to 9 p.m. That's our regular time right now. Uh, and we should be there for a little while. I think the baseball drafts are over. Jamie Calandro from the footballdiehards.com website will be joining us. We'll talk about some of the ongoing best balls that we're in. And uh, appreciate everyone coming once again. Uh, go to the Football Diehards the website, footballdiehards.com. I'm told there's great information there. If you want to subscribe, use the promo code DIEHARD to get 15% off. It's a great deal. All right, everybody, thanks for coming. I'll see you Thursday, 7 p.m. Eastern time.